So last time we talked about this uh, generating random samples where we talked about both direct and indirect methods. So by the way, uh, how many of you are able to solve the question on the indirect method uh, in the mid -sem? I think many of you got confused where are uh, deliberately ignored whether there is a term indirect or not there. Right? Uh, so when I say direct method things become very simple, right? If I give you PDF or like a CDS function, uh, if I give you a CDF function that's it. Uh, I mean you just invert it, direct method one can easily get. But the challenge there is uh, we may not always be able to invert. And the question I gave that was related to which, uh, di which distribution? F distribution. Was that easily invertible? No, right? It is a little complicated. That's what one has to go with the indirect method. And that's what I deliberately wrote that word indirect there. But many of you have missed this and also some confusion because the way TS evaluated that. But that's fine. So basically there we talked about uh, if I given a PDF or uh, rather CDF how to generate the samples. And now we are going to switch gears and uh, start talking about data is already available to us and from that how to infer the underlying CDF which is going to generate. And uh, most often what we will do is we will assume the class of the CDFs itself. We will assume that okay, this samples are coming from a Gaussian distribution or Poisson distribution or something, but we don't tell you the parameters. So unless you don't know the parameter, you don't know exactly what is the distribution, right? So that's what we will do now. We will say that data is given to us and it, we will be told a priori that this is going to come from this class, but I will not just tell you the parameters. And your job is to identify those parameters from the data. And for that we are going to look something called data reduction and there are different principles there. We will uh, start focus most of our time on the sufficiency principle and something called sufficient statistics. And today we will also cover factorization theorem. Okay, now for us, we are going to assume that data is generated. Let's say x1, x2, these are the observed data and we are going to say that this data is going to come from some underlying population, f theta and I don't know what is theta. The structure of the f theta may be known. For example, I may say that f theta is a Gaussian distribution. Then you know its structure, right? So now let's say you have this data points. Now this is just a bunch of data for us. Now let's now focus on data reduction part. Data itself of no value to me, but what is important to me is the information provided by the data. So you may be interested in obtaining some key information from this data, either by defining sample mean, sample variance or like smallest value or largest value. And to define sample mean, I am going to use all the values. So is sample variance. Similarly, to define smallest value, I am going to use all the values. Now in general, we can talk about any function of the samples, which we earlier called it as statistic. Okay, T is any function which can operate on my data samples, we call it as statistic. And uh, 
we said that sample mean, sample variance, smallest values, largest value, these are all examples of your statistic. And what they are actually giving you is a basically kind of data reduction or data summary. Mean is telling you one summary, sample variance is giving you another summary, smallest value is one summary, largest value is another summary. Now, if you are only interested in the statistic and statistic is giving me the summary and if it so happens that if two samples x and y are giving you the same summary tx and ty which happens to be the same then from information point of view both x and y are same for me because they are giving me the same information when I use my statistic. Okay, now thinking more about this, I am now going to take one particular example of statistic which is basically sum of all the values in my random sample. Now it may happen that let us say I have this. Let us say I have n samples and another bunch of samples another bunch of samples let us call this may be x and the simply x1 and let us call this x2. It may happen that if you add all of them they may add up to the same value and both of them could be still coming I mean my assumption here is that both of them are coming from the same underlying distribution. So what is now happening is this samples I am summarizing by applying some statistic in this case sum. This samples also I am summarizing by applying this statistic t. Now if they happen to give me the same value, let us say if I take t of x1 that is this and this happens to t of x2, we said that x1 and x2 they are same for me because they are providing the same information. So for me like at this point, this random sample and this random sample they are the same. So, I may group all the random sample which give me the same information and that grouping can lead to partitioning of my space. Okay. So, last time we said let us take a two dimensional case maybe this is 0 sorry this is 1 this is 1 and I am interested in all the points. My space is only this. This is my x1 and this is x2. Just let us take one hypothetical case. If I draw a line and any take one point, let us take this point and let us take this point. If I add the components of these two points, Will they have the same value? You people understand this? Let us call uh, this is one. Let us say this, let us call this is point 0.2 and point 0.8, and this point here is point 0.8 and point 0.2. Okay? So you take any point on this line, they will add up to the same value. So from data reduction point of view if I sum that all these points on the line are the same for me right they are in, indistinguishable to me right. So like that what I can do is I can now start off thinking this radar reduction as the partitioning of my space itself okay 
and in that all the points x which will map to the same number let us call t I am going to collect them and I will call that set as a t. Okay, now let us take another point. So, here the sum is 1. If I am interested in all the points whose sum is going to be let us say 0 0.5 where how, how on which line they will lie. Okay, let us consider all the points whose sum is going to be 0 0.5. So, here here is one point. This is 0. 0.5. Okay, another point is going to be here. 0 0.5, 0. And another, so if I am going to connect this line, all the points there is going to have the sum 0.5, right? So, like that, what I can do is Uh, in this case, maybe let us take IL t equals to 0.5. Now, if I am going to define A t, this is going to be basically all the points on this line, right? And similarly, if I take t equals to 1, this is going to, this set is going to include all the points on this line. Now, I can consider all these sets A T. Right? Now, what are the possible values of T? T here, what is the value of what is going to be here? It is going to be 2, right? If I am going to sum. So, maybe I will be interested in taking T from 0, all the numbers, maybe T. 0 to 2. So, if I am going to construct all the sets where t is going to between 0 to 2 and I and I take these sets a t will they overlap or they are disjoint? They are going to be disjoint right because all of them like they will be on this particular line different different lines depending on what t I am going to choose. So, that is why now if I am going to think of this, this set A t now forms a partition. So, in a way the when I reduce data, the possible reductions I am going to get that is going to partition my space in this fashion. Now, What are the advantage of this data reduction? We discussed last time, right? Data reduction is one obvious thing is if I tell you just the sum, then I do not need to maintain the entire vector, right? x1, x2 up to xn. I just has one value. I have reduced it to one value. I just need to store that one value. In that way, that is going to be useful in terms of reducing. But now, our question will be always with respect to getting information about the underlying parameter. So, that is our basic principle, right, through which we started. Like when I started talking about this, we say that I have data, what I want is extract the information about this parameter theta. But this data reduction came, we are going to use this data reduction as a means to get information about that theta. Okay. Now, now the question here is, okay, so fine, data reduction is fine. You have this uh, samples, you can reduce it to one number. The question always remains is when you reduce it, how well that reduced value is capturing information about your theta parameter. For that, we are going to look into different principles. One is called sufficient principle. 
sufficiency principle is always going to talk about the statistic. When you are going to say that your statistics is going to capture sufficient information about your parameter theta. So, sufficiency principle will govern this. And we are going to look into another thing called likelihood principle, which is going to write your data, sorry, the parameter that you are interested in as a function of your data observed. And then it is try to connect how your data points are governing or like uh, what is how your parameters and the data points are related in the best possible way or most likely fashion and the likelihood principle will try to capture that essence. Okay, so there is something called equivariance principle. We will not go into that. It is a it is just like a relaxation of this condition here, equivariance principle. So, in this case, we said that okay, x, x and y will map to the same statistics. We said that x and y are kind of uh, same for us, but why that should be the case? Okay, so maybe x and y are somewhat related, may not be exactly the same. So, that will be captured by equivariance principle, but we will not dealing much with that in this course.